So here we have a red blood cell and our red blood cells are specialised to carry oxygen. So they contain lots of a molecule called haemoglobin. Haemoglobin, as we can see here, is a protein made up of four subunits. And this means it has got a quaternary structure. So it's a really large protein. And each of these polypeptide chains contains a heme group. Each heme group contains an iron ion, and that's our Fe2+, and that's the part of the haemoglobin that's going to bind the oxygen. When oxygen binds to haemoglobin, which we often call loading, oxyhemoglobin is formed, and this reaction is reversible when oxygen unloads. We talk about the loading and unloading of oxygen from haemoglobin in relation to our lungs and our tissues. So in our lungs we have a high concentration of oxygen and in our tissues we have a low concentration of oxygen. So in the lungs, at the alveoli, oxygen has entered the capillaries and it's going to load onto haemoglobin. This is because haemoglobin has a high affinity for oxygen due to the high concentration of oxygen or partial pressure of oxygen. Affinity for oxygen just means the tendency a molecule has to bind with oxygen. So by the time this has got round to the tissues where oxygen is being used up for respiration, haemoglobin is going to have a lower affinity for oxygen because of the low concentration of oxygen. This means that oxygen readily unloads from haemoglobin for use in respiration. You need to be able to understand this in relation to the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. So what we can see on our x-axis is the partial pressure of oxygen, and that's basically just another way of saying concentration of oxygen. On our y-axis, we can see the percentage saturation of haemoglobin with oxygen, so how much oxygen is on that haemoglobin. So I'm just going to draw on some units on the x-axis, but don't worry too much about these. So we would imagine that there would be a positive correlation between how much oxygen there is and how much of this is bound to haemoglobin. But as you can see, this isn't directly proportional and the curve looks a bit like an S shape and I'll come on to why that is in a second. So we need to pay close attention to two parts of this graph. Where our partial pressure of oxygen is high, that's going to show us what the percentage saturation of haemoglobin is like in the lungs. And where the partial pressure of oxygen is lower, that's going to show us what our saturation of haemoglobin is like in tissues. So in the lungs, as you would expect, haemoglobin is saturated with oxygen. Whereas in the tissues, haemoglobin is less saturated with oxygen. That's because haemoglobin has a high affinity for oxygen in the lungs and therefore oxygen loads, whereas in the tissues, haemoglobin has a low affinity for oxygen, so oxygen unloads, as I already explained. So now going back to why the graph is S-shaped. So we can see at really low partial pressures of oxygen, as we increase the oxygen, the percentage saturation of haemoglobin doesn't increase that much. But once we get a little bit higher, the percentage saturation of oxygen increases really quickly for a small increase in oxygen. And this is due to the cooperative nature of oxygen binding. So after the first oxygen molecule binds, the shape of haemoglobin changes in a way that makes it easier for the second and third oxygen molecules to bind too, meaning haemoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen. So on the graph, the gradient gets steeper. The rate of increase in percentage saturation increases as the oxygen further increases. But after haemoglobin starts to become more saturated, it gets harder for further molecules to bind too. And this is why it plateaus. So now let's take a look at when this curve can shift. So carbon dioxide causes the curve to shift to the right, and this is called the Bohr effect. This is because when we increase the carbon dioxide in our blood, for example, when we're exercising, we lower the pH of the blood. This reduces the affinity of haemoglobin for oxygen, and that's because haemoglobin changes shape, making it harder for molecules to bind. So overall, this is beneficial because it increases the amount of oxygen that's being unloaded from haemoglobin at the tissues. And this oxygen is going to be used in respiration. And quite often in the exam, you'll be given a graph and you'll be asked to use the graph to explain this effect. So what you'll have to do is you'll have to find the concentration of oxygen or roughly the concentration of oxygen that's going to be in the tissues and find the corresponding percentage saturation of haemoglobin for each of these curves and that will show you that at a particular partial pressure of oxygen, the percentage saturation of haemoglobin will be lower. So finally, you need to understand that haemoglobin is a molecule that's found in lots of different organisms. However, its structure may differ slightly between these organisms, depending on the environment that they're adapted to live in. This is because haemoglobin is a protein made of amino acids, and when we change these amino acids, haemoglobin can have a different structure. 
This is because its primary structure changes, resulting in it folding in a slightly different way. This can change its shape and the affinity that it has for oxygen. So some organisms, oxyhemoglobin dissociation curves may have shifted to the left, while others may have shifted to the right. And in order to interpret this, we need to pick an advantage, whether that's in the lungs or in the tissues. So when the curve shifted to the left, that means haemoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen and means that it loads more readily in the lungs at a lower oxygen concentration. And this is our main advantage. We don't need to worry about the effect on the tissues. This is particularly useful for organisms in low oxygen environments because they can load more oxygen in the lungs. An example of this would be fetal haemoglobin. Fetal haemoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen than adult haemoglobin. This is important because by the time the mother's blood reaches the placenta, its oxygen saturation has decreased, and this is because some has been used up by the mother's body. Therefore, fetal haemoglobin needs to be better at absorbing oxygen than its mother's haemoglobin, so that the fetus can still get oxygen from its mother's blood across the placenta. In organisms whose curve has shifted to the right, this means that they have a lower affinity for oxygen. This time, we don't need to worry about the effect of this in the lungs, it's going to be beneficial for our tissues. So we can see from our graph that at the same partial pressure of oxygen in the tissue, our haemoglobin again has a lower saturation of oxygen, and this means that more has been unloaded to the tissues, similar to the Bohr effect. This is important in organisms that need more oxygen in their tissues, for example, ones with a high metabolic rate, which may be small or active. So these are the main two types of ways which organisms can be adapted to their environment by having different types of haemoglobin. This is really important because it enables organisms to survive better in their environments.